Well, hey everybody, good morning and welcome to session 36 of our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Genesis uh, in our virtual life Bible study here at City on a Hill. My name is Pastor Derek. Once again, welcome back. Uh, if you're new here, if you're a guest with us here this morning, welcome in for the first time. Glad to have you here. Drop a comment below and let us know who you are, how you heard about us. Um, if you're a church member, then still drop a comment and just say hi. would love to know that you're tuning in now. Uh, we are continuing our study today in the Joseph narrative. And there are some things this morning that I think are, are, are really interesting that actually have nothing to do with Joseph. Um, most of this story and most of the study this morning, you're going to find out, has actually everything to do with either Pharaoh or Jacob, who is also now called Israel. So the story begins uh, this morning in uh, chapter 45, I believe. I don't have my, my notes in front of me this morning, but um, they are uh, in the study guide linked in the description below. So uh, if you don't have that in front of you, it would be helpful, I think, to go there and download it. It's a, a PDF. You can keep it on your screen or on your phone while you're watching this or vice versa. Uh, print it out is always helpful as well. There's a spot on there. For those of you who haven't done the study guides, there's four days of study, uh, two, two questions a day, and so it helps you work verse by verse through uh, the passages that we're covering. But the story begins today with Joseph, um, the news of Joseph's brother reaching Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh is uh, very pleased. He's, there's a positive response uh, to the news that these are actually Joseph's brothers. And he offers Joseph a, um, a large amount of, of uh, wealth and resources, Egyptian wagons that were far better built than what the uh, Hebrew Jacobites had or the Israelites at this point had, um, to go back with these uh, carts, with all of this livestock, with all these resources, to take Jacob and his entire household, the house of Jacob, which means not only his sons, but his son's wives, all of their children, all of the servants in their households. I mean, this would have been a large number of people, well over probably 100 people. 70, I think, 66 is what the text says, came into Egypt just from the household. That's just Jacob's uh, wives, sorry, sons, wives, and uh, children. So uh, children and grandchildren, if you will. Uh, coming in, but that doesn't account for uh, the, the household servants, people that were working in tandem in the house of Jacob. Probably would have been well over 100 people coming. And so uh, Pharaoh gives Joseph all these resources. He says, go back, take Jacob, take the household. And uh, Joseph, in turn, blesses Benjamin with even more than the other brothers. He gives them five changes of clothes uh, as opposed to just the one change of clothes that the brothers receive. He gives them a fair amount of, of shekels uh, to take with him as well. Again, um, it, this, this reveals, I think, something about the relationship with Joseph and his brothers up to this point. I've mentioned in studies before that perhaps some of the reason why Joseph was testing his brothers was to see whether or not they could really be trusted. Um, now, this wasn't to like harm them or hurt them. Some, some of that has come to me. Some questions have come to me. You know, was Jacob doing this to get revenge on his brothers? And I would say almost emphatically, no. Uh, if Jacob wanted, I'm sorry, if Joseph wanted revenge on his brothers, he could have gotten revenge on his brothers. He was the second most powerful person in Egypt. Playing little mind games with him, little, little you know, uh, keep you in prison, send you back, bring your brother back. Uh, this, these are not punish or punitive, sorry, punitive acts at all. So um, I think what he was doing is not punishing, but testing to see if they were really trustworthy, if they could really be trusted. Is Benjamin alive? I mean, Benjamin was the other son of, of Jacob and Rachel, and they were the two most hated because they were the two most favored by their father Jacob. And so uh, I think Joseph wanted to know if Benjamin was really alive, if he was well, if the brothers had, had tricked him and sold him into slavery like they did himself. And so um, this uh, news is brought back to Jacob. Jacob is astonished that Joseph is alive. In fact, at first he doesn't believe it. His heart, it says, grows numb, um, which means it, he, he has no feeling towards what they're saying. He has no, will, no real way of, of even uh, comprehending the news. 
How is Joseph alive? I thought he was dead. He died years ago at this point. How is he alive? And furthermore, how did he end up in Egypt? And how did he end up becoming the second most powerful person in Egypt? I mean, so many questions that, that Jacob must have had. But when he sees the Egyptian carts rolling in with all this shekels and livestock and clothing and all this different stuff, he knew that this must be true. Now, again, Joseph tells his brothers not to quarrel on their journey home. And, and there's a lot of interpretive uh, questions about what did he mean by that? Did he mean just don't fight with one another? Did he mean don't um, fight over a specific topic with one another, which probably almost certainly would have been, what do we tell our father about now that Joseph is back and how do we explain this to him? We told him he was killed by an animal. How is he still alive? Um, the text never says what they say to his to, to Jacob. It, it, it never tells us what story he's given. It insinuates he probably wasn't given the whole story. And it insinuates that Joseph likely didn't want them to give the whole story because he did not want there to be further division. He wanted unity. Jo Joseph had fully forgiven and reconciled, was beginning the reconciliation process with his brothers. And so he didn't want to create further division. He didn't seek harm for them. He wasn't even looking for justice for them. As we're going to find out later, you know, Joseph could see kind of the bigger picture of what God was intending through this whole thing. And, and as we know, moving into the book of Exodus, uh, this is an incredibly crucial part of Israel's story. And so um, it doesn't seem like Jacob was probably told the whole story. When he finally believes, though, it revives his spirit. Um, he is all of a sudden filled with energy, and uh, he begins the journey. There's an interesting story with Jacob where he goes to a place called Beersheba. It's a, not the first time we've seen this place before. And God comes to him in a vision in the night. This is a unique instance where God, it's the only time in Genesis where God appears in a vision in the night. We've seen him in dreams in the night. We've seen God just appear in the night. But a vision suggests that this is like a dream, but jo Joseph, or sorry, Jacob is awake. And so... Um, Kind of a unique deal there. He, uh, the way he calls out to him, Jacob, Jacob, kind of the dual name, is very reminiscent of uh, how God appears to Abraham in Abraham's, uh, when, when God comes to him. Um, it's also uh, reminiscent in the way that he reveals himself to, uh, how he reveals himself to Jacob. He reveals himself as the God of your father. Um, this was also done with his father, Isaac, uh, earlier in Genesis, in the same location. When Isaac was in Beersheba, God came to Isaac and revealed to him that he was the father of his father, Abraham. So there's some connections there. Um, the, the Jacob, Jacob also anticipates how God will come to Moses as well. Moses, Moses. Um, What's interesting, probably, I think, more than anything, is that in this whole thing, he promises him to make him a great nation. Now, this is important language, because what this does is it, it, it validates that Jacob, who is now called Israel, is in fact the heir to the Abrahamic blessing, the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. All the way back in Genesis chapter 12, when we first meet Abram, um, this is the promise that God makes to Abraham, is that you will be the father of a great nation. I will make a great nation from you, and you'll have many descendants, and so on and so forth. And up until this point, Jacob has been renamed. He's called Israel now because he has striven with God and prevailed, and God has certainly blessed him and done a lot of things with Jacob that you would expect him to do. Uh, with the heir of the Abrahamic covenant. But now in this passage, we see God promising him the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. And it certainly is uh, a promise that comes to fruition because right after that, we get a genealogy of those who come with Jacob into Egypt. And it is the sons of um, all of the different women that Jacob had children with. And so um, he... Uh, Starts with Leah, who has the most offspring, and then Zilpha, and then you get Rachel, and then Bilha, And it gives the list of sons and their sons and the people that um, go down generationally up to, I think, just grandsons. I don't think it gets to great-grandsons. I don't remember off the top of my head. But 
uh, 66 people in total. And what you're going to find out is that in these sons that, that come from Jacob, these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and then their sons, if you do some, some research on their names, if you have a good Bible concordance, what you find out is that many of their sons become prominent tribes that go all the way up until the time of David. And so um, this is an important promise that God makes, and it comes to fulfillment. Jacob is made into a great nation, the nation of Israel. And that nation has 12 tribes, and those, those 12 tribes become incredibly important in the time of Judges, uh, all the way up into the monarchy with Saul and David and uh, following. Ephraim and Manasseh are mentioned there. Those are Joseph's sons that he has in Egypt with his wife, uh, Potiphera. And uh, the, uh, they take on the half-tribe uh, title, if you will, that replaces another one of the tribes. And we'll talk more about that when we get to that. I don't want to give any of that away. But um, that genealogy is long. It's arduous, but read through it. It's important. Um, I'm going to have you make lists in the study guide this week with each of the women's names at top, each of the mom's names up top, and the children that come uh, out of each of those lines so that you can kind of see on paper what these 12 tribes looked like and um, the impact that they're going to have moving forward. So hope you enjoy the study. It's a very informative study this week. Uh, the, um, the, uh, st the, the group discussion, sorry, is on uh, gratitude and the impact, the importance of gratitude. Uh, we learned that, that, that uh, Pharaoh blesses Joseph uh, and his brothers and his whole family gives them the choice land in Egypt to come and live on forever. A uh, very unusual thing for a monarch to do. And the best, the best guess is that he did this out of gratitude for Joseph. If Joseph had not been there to interpret the dream and put in, in place this plan to save seven years of plenty that would provide for them in this seven years of famine, Egypt would be in a very different place than where they were with Joseph um, on their side. And so I think that Pharaoh is very grateful for, for Joseph. He's very grateful for the contribution that Joseph makes to Egypt. And he sees that without him, things would be pretty grim. And so um, I think gratitude has an incredibly impactful place in the life of a believer. It helps shape our perspective and how we view things that happen to us and how we relate to one another within the body of Christ. So very important for you to uh, do that group discussion together. Be honest, open. Uh, you're, you're sort of learning how to share in these groups, in these Bible studies, which I think is a unique feature of our Bible studies here at City on a Hill. Um, we're opening the uh, services up to 125 now in person, so we're growing that number. We had a unanimous approval from the elders. So if you've been a little on the fence about coming, didn't want to take a spot because you knew other people were wanting to come, uh, register. We'd love to have you. Uh, that's, that's starting this Sunday. So uh, 25 more people per service, 50 more people on a Sunday is great. Uh, we're hitting capacity in our registration, so uh, we want to open it up and have a few more people still safely distanced, still wearing masks, temperature checks, all that good stuff. Hopefully not for too much longer, but until then we'll do what we got to do. Uh, but hope you enjoy the study and uh, are connected to a group. If there's anything I can do, as always, message me, call me, call the church, whatever you got to do to get a hold of me. I'm on Facebook. There's a lot of ways you can reach me. You can drop a comment again and just say, hey, Derek, contact me with uh, an email address or however you feel comfortable is fine, and I will get back with you. Praying for you this week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.